You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, Internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. In these uncertain economic times, you've got to do whatever you can to save money. One of our biggest expenses can be our cars, especially when unexpected repair bills hit. Not anymore. If you own a vehicle with less than 130,000 miles, is less than 12 years old, has a warranty about to expire, or even no warranty at all, you could stop paying for car repairs. Roadside assistance, towing, and rental coverage are all included. Don't wait for the next repair. Make one free call right now to see if you qualify. If your vehicle vehicle is less than 12 years old, has less than 130,000 miles, even if it's out of warranty, paying for car repairs can become a thing of the past. Call us right now and get your car protected before your next repair bill hits. Get protection and no more repair bills. Call 800-696-1030. Again, 800-696-1030. That's 800-696-1030. 800-696-1030. Joe had huge problems with the IRS. I knew it was coming. I hadn't filed taxes since 1990. All the IRS letters coming in added up to a nightmare. It got up to like $68,000. My heart started beating fast. It's like, there's no way, man. I mean, I ain't going to be able to do this. Then they stopped his paycheck. So that's when I started making phone calls and found U.S. Tax Shield. U.S. Tax Shield went to work immediately. They just took the bull by the horns. What blew my mind is he called the IRS right then and there. So why is U.S. Tax Tax Shield A plus rated with the Better Business Bureau? Joe knows. They saved me a ridiculous amount of money. If you owe more than ten thousand dollars to the IRS or state, choose the company Joe chose. U.S. Tax Shield. It was the best decision I made. U.S. Tax Shield is the way to go. Life is good. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Call eight hundred four seven one thirty two eighty seven. U.S. Tax Shield. Boo raw. Yes. <laughs> 800-471-3287. 800-471-3287. The Internet will never be the same. You're listening to K98talk.com. We will keep this promise to the American people. If you like your doctor, you will be able to keep your doctor. Period. If you like your health care plan, you'll be able to keep your health care plan. Period. This is the most transparent administration in history. Not even a smidgen of corruption. Fact is, we had four dead Americans. What difference at this point does it make? If you've got a business, you didn't build that. Oh, welcome to the face. Welcome to the face. Keep on doing what you do, Rick. You're my favorite host, favorite host, favorite host. It's time to hear the truth about America's biggest challenges. You're listening to America Off the Rails with your host, Rick Robinson. All right, folks. Well, this is America Off the Rails. I'm your host, Rick Robinson. Welcome to the Better Late Than Never Roundhouse Edition, the post-debate special. I'd like to give a special shout-out to the folks at Skype, some pencil neck geek in Skype decided that he needed to make some changes. I don't know if it was to justify his job or what it was, but we've been spending the last half hour trying to sort out the mess that you made. Thanks, Skippy. Um, remind me to not ever... I don't know. At this point, I'd... Like it, Corky it, better. Yeah. And let me, let, me, let me add Staples Cheap Pads to the list of late night uh, uh, office supply and radio rants. I just try to rip off three pages of notes... And I could have used uh, an origami expert. I got uh, little pieces of paper everywhere. <laughs> and I'm the only one in a good mood. Oh, my, my God. My Skype worked just fine. My notes yeah, Rick- are all on my phone. <laughs> but we got the emergency repairs done. There you go. <laughs> hey, the good news is we're finally here. Okay, so... um. So we know how I am, and we know how JD is. Stacy says she's in a great mood, so I'll, I'll let her start off. What were your first well, impressions of the um, night? I honestly have to say it was not what I expected. Um, yes. Hmm? Yeah, it sucked. Oh, I didn't think it sucked. 
Ugh. Ugh. Sorry, Ugh. I don't enjoy a cage match. No, that's what I was looking for. I, th- I thought the questions would be. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I wasn't all that impressed with the questions, but, but um, I expected, I guess, Ted Cruz to own it a little better than he did. Overall, I wasn't that impressed. Quick takes where, where and, and this is what surprised me. This was the last debate before Iowa and New Hampshire. And for any of you that were able to get through more than a half hour of it, kudos to you. But following up on Stacey's point, I thought the questions were, I thought the questions were meh. You know, there, there, there were seven people left on, on the on, on the primetime debate stage. It was Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, Ben Caution, Jeb Bush, Chris Christie, uh, John Kasich, and Rand Paul. And what really caught me, because everybody knew the news of the last 48 hours, was Trump taking his ball and going home and going to play with his wife's door so the Mexicans don't get past the wall. And that he wasn't going to this debate. And for all the hemming and whoring by, by the punditry and radio hosts and the candidate campaigns themselves about Donald Trump sucking up so much of the oxygen in the room so that we could finally have a really good debate, you know, they spent the first 20, 25 minutes of that debate bringing up Donald Trump themselves because, like children, they couldn't gratuitously, uh, they, they, they could not help but give a gratuitous shot to him. And I thought that that was a big loss. I thought that from a political point of view, that really said that, that, that these people really don't know how to politic. They were the dogs who caught the car. They got what they wanted and then spent the first 20 minutes talking about Donald Trump. This clip, I thought, honestly summed up about every answer I got tonight from all these candidates in the debate. Mr. Madison, what you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. And that would have been J.D. if he was moderating the debate tonight. Well, I mean, first of all, I don't think it was that bad at all. Um, I don't agree. Um, You know, I think Marco, first of all, when you're at the debate right before the Iowa caucus, you are speaking to an Iowa audience, number one. So we're speaking to New Hampshire. Well, you're also speaking to New Hampshire, but you're speaking to those early states. Okay. now when. You said the first 20, 25 minutes, some candidates actually studiously avoided mentioning him. Not some of the really. moderators asked about him specifically. Ted Cruz made a production out of him, which kind of turned me off early. He kind of made a joke out of it, which was kind of funny. I, um, have, a, I have a note here. I have a note here. It says, as of 930, Cruz had had nothing but bad moments. I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... I think he did a couple things that fell a little flat. And when he started to argue with Chris Wallace about the debate rules, that was it just stop that. OK, this isn't your high school debate team. Um, and everybody I, I thought for the most part early on, the speaking was was divided up pretty equally. I think it got kind of unequal towards the end. Um you know, once again, Ben Carson did himself no favors. He probably, I, I would say, just without the in-depth analysis, he got the least speaking time. On. <laughs> when he did speak, though, I mean, he did have a couple of good answers. It's just he can't put any energy around them. Like, if we were still reading candidate comments in the newspaper, Ben Carson could very well win this election because he's pretty plain spoken. Um and very thoughtful. But so he, if we still read what they said, but we're not in that. Can I type can I world. give you my take on Carson? Because 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 yeah. let me tell you the one thing that I've discovered is an insomniac. On the nights I can't sleep, I'm gonna play him on a loop. I'll be out in about thirty seconds. Just saying. Yeah. And here's the here's the thing with Carson, and this is why I yes and no on what you were saying about him. He fell asleep waiting to get called on three quarters of the way through the debate. And he was asked a question on immigration. Specifically, the tone and tenor of the question was about immigration from the southern border. Now, we can sit here and put it in a physics vacuum and go, well, that was never said. But that's what the question's tone and tenor was. 
then as commander-in-chief and president of the United States, you have to be able to infer what people are trying to communicate to you. And he started on immigration, and I was with him, but it was within 15, it was less than 30 seconds, he shifted gears to ISIS and was rolling this into immigration. And listen, intuitively, if you had 20 minutes to sit there and explain it, I kind of understand where he was going. But it was a Grandpa Bernie moment but for, for, for him in, 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 in my mind. And, and, and here's the, let me go back to Cruz for a second. Of all the people in the world, Deion Sanders popped into my head about Ted Cruz. And what Deion Sanders had said about two weeks ago when the Panthers, I forget who the, the Panthers were playing this game. Well, no, I forget who the Panthers were playing. They were up 31 nothing at half. And they come back, and they ended up winning the game 31-28. And in the post game, Dion said the Panthers needed that game and needed that experience because what they hadn't learned up to that point was to quote how to put a gnat away with a sledgehammer. And tonight, if you're going to buy into the polling and you're going to buy into the word on the ground about the size of Cruz's ground game, with an absent Donald Trump, who in my mind made a political mistake by not going to this debate, Cruz had that opportunity to put Iowa away. And to go back to Stacey's point about his ticky-tacking about the debate rules and interrupting in, 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 in a Rand Paul-style way, I don't think he did that tonight. And what I walked away from this debate thinking, I mean, I don't, I don't think Ted Cruz damaged himself, but I think Cruz had an opportunity to put Iowa away and didn't. And I walked away from this saying to myself, I wonder if the, the lion's share of people who were going to be swayed tonight who were formal Donald Trump supporters, I thought by the performances, I thought the two best candidates positioned to grab those as of tonight's debate through their performances were Marco Rubio and Chris Christie. So do I. You know, but the more Chris Christie talks, the more I would like to see him be like attorney general, not president. Well, no, you know, look, Christie is interesting because he captures that vein. I, I, I want to go back to I, I, I want to go back to our perennial. Stay out the bushes. First of all, I actually, this guy is such a jerk off. I have written down, I have comments next to all the candidates' names on, on, on top of the specific notes I, I, I took as to, as to what they were speaking about. Do you know I literally have down next to Jeb Bush, this is what I have, angry and cocaine. This is what I have written next to Jeb Bush. Because he seemed like he was blown out of his shoes tonight. And I honestly think, I want to give an homage to Mr. Ed Norton. Jeb Bush should change his campaign website to eatabullet.com. And for those of you who say I mumble in my New York accent, that's eatabullet.com. That means go back to the green room, rack it, and crack it. I listened to him speak, and this is where I came out on Bush. Bush campaigns, I think, as if he is playing president of the United States, Walter Mitty type in his mind, and is just waiting for the rest of the rubes who vote to catch up and realize we're supposed to put them in the office that he's playing at every day. Well, you know, the thing that I will say is the one question I did like that they asked Bush, because I find this odd. I don't understand the um, strategy behind it at all. When you are as low in the polls as Jeb Bush is, why are you spending and why is your PAC spending all this money attacking Marco Rubio? And he ducked that question when he was. He, I know. I, 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 and, and to me, number one, it causes a lot of dissension within the primary. Number two, what what is the objective there? I mean, if you want to take something, you got to take it from the guy who currently has the most marbles. It's pissy, it's pissy, pissy, petulant politics. Oh, Petul and that, when you see that thing where he's like the, the farm guy that's pointing that ad, I hate that ad. But here's the, see, but here's, here's the whole thing with Jeb. And, and, and Jeb's out there, and he's so angry, and he's going, to, I'll, and he has me. Oh, 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 oh. I'm glad, I'm glad we were talking about this detestable ass bag. Because you, for a debate, like I said, and again, I, I think Stacey has me wrong. I wasn't looking for a cage match. I actually, contrary to that, I honestly thought that they, their answers lacked some real specifics that I saw in earlier debates. One of the only real solid specific answers I saw that I wish other people would pick up on where Ted Cruz didn't miss a beat 
and didn't sidestep when they asked him for a specific policy prescription after repealing Obamacare. And I'm going to go back later to those three points that he hit. But, 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 but Jeb Bush did provide the only, to my mind, comedy of the evening. Do you remember when they had the, 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 the YouTube woman, the, uh, uh, the Mexican broad that went in the Army and became a citizen, and now she's thinking about moving back to Mexico? Yeah, good luck with that. You, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Dulce Dul- Candy. Dulce Candy with all her nonsense. So, you know, I come to this country, and then I joined U.S. military, and then I opened my own business, and, and now you see her in the video. She's well-dressed. She's a good-looking broad. She is not going back to Tiwaka province where they're putting heads on pikes every night. So it, it, it's a ruse. However, however, the Jeb did give us, the Jeb baby, the, the, he gave us one of the only funny points of the debate I have written down here. He says to Dulcie Candy, Dulcie Candy, which, by the way, by the way, Dulcie Candy, we know what you do for a living. Oh, stop. Dulcie Candy is nothing more than a porn star name. I don't care who says what. It just is. But here was, here was Jeb Bush's, this is the only funny moment of the night, my point, and it was one of his great Uncle Bernie moments. He says, he says to the YouTube video, Dulcie Candy, who is a creator on the YouTube He called it the YouTube. I swear to God. Rewind the tape. He called it the YouTube. You know, when old people talk about things they've never used and don't understand. Oh, on the on the Apple. On the Apple. You think the Apple. You press the buttons on the Apple there from the Steve Jobs. <laughs> oh, my God. I missed moment. that. I honestly missed that. Oh, I was, I was dying for anything. But let me go back to to what I thought was one of the few real good policy prescriptions. And, and b- before we do that, I, I want to put my two cents in on Rand Paul, who I was a big supporter of before he launched his campaign. He is in, he's, a, he's an angry little douche. He just is. He, interu- he was less angry tonight than he had been, though. He doesn't talk about himself enough. He's rip- ripping other people. But I want to go back, and again, some of the questions tonight on that panel I thought were a little gotcha. Um, but you know you're going to get that with Chris Wallace. Chris Wallace gave Cruz a question about his repeal of Obamacare. And what Cruz did, he rolled that in and spoke about what he titled health care reform. And he said the three things he would do immediately after getting rid of Obamacare to ensure that everybody had affordable access to health care was, one, make sure he could sell it across state lines, two, expand uh, the health savings accounts, and three, de-link health insurance from employment. Those are three very easy sound bites to get across they make sense to people. Obamacare is a nightmare. Why is he the only person that is speaking this effectually about Obamacare? I I honestly don't know. I mean, I, I think that is something that's pretty important to me as a conservative, um, you know, in terms of turning back the clock on what is, you know, a steamroller towards socialized medicine, which is a train wreck in and of itself. Um, you know, and, and we actually had, you know, Joseph Levine on the show uh, last week, and he was talking about, you know, Americans asking him about Israel's program. He's like, you can't extend that to, like, 250 million people. That would be ridiculous. Well, yeah, we learned <laughs> we learned that you can't even extend it a little bit. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, three very specific things on the repeal of Obamacare, and I can't, I guess, I, I think it's, He's the only one that got the question because he is the most vocal about it. So maybe it was a more of a put your money where your mouth is kind of question. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I thought that I, I, I thought well, well, I thought and again, I, I thought that Rubio, I thought I, I think if you were going to do it on points, I think Rubio had the best debate with Christie a strong second. Uh, again, I don't think that that Cruz hurt himself, but I thought one of Rubio's best lines is what well, yeah, bro, Uncle Bernie's been running around there going, I don't understand uh, health care. Uh, 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 uh. The, the the Danes do it. Uh, uh, Latvia does it. Uh, uh. You know, these are countries that have 11 people in it. So yeah, right. he never really gets to, you know, I, I heard Josh Ernest. I mean, you want to hear the biggest joke in the world. Josh Ernest had the balls to say the other day that he is proud of the quote unquote robust debate that is being had on the Democratic primary side. And I sat there and I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You have two white fossilized geriatrics that a basic, a robust debate, they're basically arguing whether the top marginal tax rate in this country should be 85% or 90. You know, that's the big debate that they're having over there 
with uh, with uh, with Uncle Speedo. Boom, boom, boom. But I mean, then coming back tonight's to Democratic Center. debate brought to you by Ambien and the Rascal Scooter. <laughs> when when Rubio said well, that he you have a socialist, a felon, yeah. and that other guy. Well, when, when when Rubio said that he thought that Bernie... Hey, to be fair, we have our the other guy, too. I mean, there there is always Kasich. <laughs> that's that's basically Sanders what he is. We have the seven other guy. the other guys. Well, that's true. When Sanders said that he would be... He would be, he thought that... When Rubio said say he thought Sanders would be a great president of Sweden. Oh, yeah, that was good. You know, inter- interesting thing about Rubio, if you've been tracking the numbers, since these last two debates, Cruz has actually been on a downswing and Rubio's kind of been on the, been on an upswing. Which is interesting when you think about it because everybody keeps thinking that at some point they're going to start being able to chip away at the Donald Trump supporters, whoever they may be. And God rest your souls if you are, just saying. Um, but it seems, honestly, what's happening is a lot of crew support may be starting to slowly shift towards Rubio. But no, but think about that. That makes a lot of sense, Rick, because what you have is you have Donald Trump and, and, and Ted Cruz who have locked head to head recently within the last couple of weeks. So Cruz had spent the whole campaign until locking up with Donald as Iowa got tight, really running a Bernie Sanders type above it all, not really getting that nasty about a campaign. But Trump has forced him into doing that. So, you know, it's, it, it's Rubio right now, is, is, is if he plays his cards right, can basically be the beneficiary at this point in time in the primary of, you know, while your enemies are in the process of destroying yourself, it's better to stand there and keep your mouth shut. You know, this is going to happen to all of the front runners through the process. You just have a point right now where what I think is you have Trump and Cruz going at it with each other. You have them spending money uh, finally against each other. Now, you have $25 million being spent against Marco Rubio, but I think it's so well publicized that the money is from a Jeb Bush pact. I don't know that it has any effect on him because... You know, I happen to like Rubio. I like Cruz. You know, I, I think that somebody was, who is, if you're prone to be a Marco Rubio supporter, I think that finding out Jeb Bush is attacking you would make you more attractive a candidate. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. I, I guess my biggest thing with Rubio has to be a point that Stacy made a couple of Roundhouse shows back, which was uh, if it wasn't for the Gang of Eight fiasco, this would probably be a much different debate. Because I think that's the one thing that everybody keeps trying to hang back around his neck. He did dodge a couple of good shots from that today, and he he stuck his ground with it. And he did try to point out that you know that it wasn't blanket amnesty that he was supporting. I just don't know if the public's going to buy that because he's the one that used the word choices that said this language means that they're trying to support amnesty. And then a few short months later, he came out using the same language and trying to say that it wasn't necessarily the same type of amnesty. I just don't know if that's going to work for him. But this is what I think that you have to understand about Marco Rubio and why he translates so well on the stump. I agree with you. You know, I, I probably would have, and I haven't come out and endorsed any, any particular specific candidate. And I think that Rubio is somebody I may have done that for very early on in the process. My biggest sticking point was his, 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 his walking as far down the plank as he did with that Gang of Eight bill. I, I mean, that, that disgusted me. You know, to my mind, when... It was cool on the right to be ripping the hell out of Trump. You know, I had to sit here and be intellectually honest with myself and say, okay, I might not like this about Trump, but I like the way that he speaks to immigration. So for me, it was it was uh, something that I wanted to see Marco get over. I think that he's doing that with the voter like me, because when you see this man and Stacy and I have been fortunate enough to see him um, in large venues like most people, but we actually had the opportunity to have a lunch with him. Um, in a very small venue down in D.C. And whether he is on the stump in front of 10,000 or whether he's having a lunch in front of 25 or 30 people, the way that he speaks in crescendos is very much Southern, uh, a a Baptist-style preacher. I mean, you can walk in and go, and I hate this guy, but the way that he speaks and about the way that it's a 21st century America and you combine that with his stump speech, I think that if he keeps speaking to immigration the way that he has, he... Uh, I think I maybe. Uh, I think we just lost JD. 
says he's still there. Says he's still there. They're trying to get him back. Oh, yeah, there it goes. Now it's actually showing up on my screen that we're trying to call him back. All right, so anyway, while we're trying to see if we well, can get... I, I just want to say this because I think Chris Christie hit the nail on the head. First of all, I'm tired of hearing about what you said about this during the debate on this bill on the Senate floor. This this crap between Rubio and Cruz has got to stop. Um, it's just, it's really that simple. Um you know, when you when you take a look at that whole thing, you know, yes, the gang of eight happened. OK, you had a young senator who was doing his level best to try to get along with his colleagues. He is very plain about the fact the bill was too big. You can't bite off that much. And here's what you have to do first. And I what I don't understand is why when he's very clear about what he sees now in light of Islamic terrorism, lack of security at the border, lack of vetting. We can't get people on visas out of the country when they're supposed to leave. Why? But you did Gang of Eight. Uh, okay. Guess what? I don't think that anymore. I, I just I don't understand why we do these purity tests that every decision these people have made over their entire careers has to be the perfect conservative con you know, decision, or we can't even take a look at them, especially when the policies they're advocating now are different. Well, that, no, and, I, and drives, I agree with you. That drives me nuts about the right wing of the party. No, I agree with you. I mean, I've even seen other hosts that have basically on their social media pl platforms been telling people that uh, that they cannot and will not support Rubio because of his uh, pro-amnesty stance on the Gang of Eight. And I'm just thinking, look, he was brand new to this. Obviously, he was new enough that he's going to get talked into doing some crazy things, thinking that he might be doing the right thing. So I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. The only reason that I brought it up was because, again, I don't know if the average conservative voter is going to be willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, because that's what I keep hearing over and over again. As a matter of fact, we have a shout out from somebody in the chat room. Uh, the one, the only Dread Pirate Ron, who basically said, as soon as you brought up Gang of Eight, I was done. Um, so, I mean, there are people that just will not be able to let it go. And I think that may well, ultimately hurt remember, him. Remember, Chuck Schumer actually sponsored the Religious Freedom Restoration Act at the federal level. Chuck is a rabid progressive. Yes, got it. But everything Chuck Schumer has done over the entire course of his career isn't completely asinine. And yes, if you're going to try to work on a bill, you have to work with leaders on the other side. So that's what we called negotiation back when that's something our government was actually capable of doing. See, that's the thing I think people forget. Working across the aisle and having bipartisan committees come out with compromises is not something that was really foreign, okay, to government practice prior to Barack Obama. <laughs> That's actually kind of how it worked. Well, yeah, I mean, you can even hear uh, Reagan used to allude to the same type of thing back when he was in office uh, and Tip O'Neill was running everything uh, in the legislative branch. It would be like, you know, from 9 to 5, we hated each other. 5.30, we were out having beers together. People would still figure out how to work together. We don't do that anymore. We haven't for no, a long time. Because the hard line Obama has, has, has put in the sand at, in moving in a very multicultural, you know, socialist direction, is, and he does not negotiate. So when you're talking about a president who just vetoes everything... And then you've got, you know, an electorate that's saying, no, you have the rise of the Tea Party and we put all these people in Congress. Number one, don't be surprised that nothing you want gets done. He's going to veto it all. OK, so, yeah, we've got some real squishes in Congress that should probably be replaced. But the fact that Obama's agenda has still moved forward is not solely the fault of Congress. You've got to put some blame on the guy who puts a big red you know red veto on everything um number one and number two this whole idea that our candidates have have had have have to have had the exact position we would like to have them given the environment today for their entire career given the pace at which the world changes <laughs> and some realities that have become very clear in the last three to five years in terms of national security I just think that's a test, 
you know, that nobody's going to pass ultimately. No, and I agree. And it, 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 you're, you're bringing that up reminds me of something. There was uh, an odd article that I saw that started surfacing probably about a week to 10 days ago. And it talked about things that an 18 year old Ted Cruz once said were his uh, adult ambitions in life. And I believe one of them was to become an adult film star. And everybody's like, how could he be conservative when he said that when he was 18? Okay, I'm going to okay. speak out of turn for just a second here, but I was an 18 year old guy once too. We all wanted to be porn stars at that age. Can I just be honest for a second? With none just of Just a second, because I'm kind of grossed out. <laughs> I, you know. I'm not sure I wanted to know what 18-year-old boys were thinking when I was 18. Now I'm scared. <laughs> yeah, well, you're welcome. <laughs> All right. But yeah, no, and that's what I'm saying about these purity tests. And do you know why Donald holds on to his lead? Because his supporters don't give him any purity tests. He could change from what he said yesterday in three days and say something different. They'll be like, okay. I think at some point, we have just got to relax a little bit and understand, you know, I've changed my mind about certain policy things over the last three to five years. Why would I expect somebody who actually lives in the Senate, reviews things like intelligence reports, okay, um, you know, sees a bunch of things that I don't see, why would I expect that maybe he's not going to change his position? That would be stupid. Yeah, you know, I, I guess that's one of the things that's always dr driven me nuts because everybody always says that people can change, except our politicians, apparently, because they can't ever change their mind on anything or they're immediately branded traitors. I, I never no. really have understood the concept. It's like we expect our politicians to be completely stoic, unyielding, have one point of view, and it better match 100% with ours or we're not going to consider them loyal to our belief system. Yeah, I mean, I honestly believe that the Trump versus everybody else battle is bad enough and doing enough damage to the party and posts enough risks in the general election um, that the other smaller internal wars, all the you know Bush ads that are anti-Rubio, all the snarking back and forth between Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio on immigration. You know, at this point, I'm not worried about the debate that happened in 2013 or 2012. I'm really not. I want to know what you're going to do going forward, given the context of the world we live in today. And maybe I'm weird. I don't know. Oh, no. You're well, not, I mean, I'm you're weird, not. but maybe that's a weird perspective. No, it's not. Um, I think it's um, the perspective of someone who's always uh, been involved somewhat with government. I, I'm making an assumption at this point, but I know that that was one of the um, I was a social science nerd in high school, just to be honest. By the time I graduated high school, before I even made it into college, I had already had 26 social science credits. You only need eight to graduate. Um, I was always, if there was an elective that involved any type of government, I was in it. Um, so, I mean, to me, it's not an odd perspective because I've always liked the government. I've always liked reading uh, the history of how things got started, why they got started, who did what to make it that way. And it just seems like at this point we've lost track of so many of those things like the fact that people that that today hate each other used to actually the the, the people in that in those positions a generation ago they didn't hate each other it wasn't about let i'm gonna stick it to you just because then i can go back to my constituents and i'm gonna tell them that i was able to stick it to you they they used to well, do the things to get that, things the done fact, the fact that hillary clinton oh god okay, can get on a what I will call a debate stage that really isn't and say that um, Islam is not is not our enemy. Radical Islam is not, you know, an enemy. But Republicans are. What? Yeah, exactly. Uh, what? I mean, that's just crazy. You know, she is proud of the fact that she considers the Republicans in Congress her enemy. And well, how how do you how do you then make government work ever if you have a ruling party in Congress and a ruling party in the executive? You can't. 
I mean, everybody's like, oh, the country's going straight to hell if Hillary or Bernie gets elected. I'm like, no, it's going to be another four years of getting nothing done because I don't believe we'll lose majorities in Congress. Yeah, I nothing mean, will get done. Yeah. No, well, I mean, we'll honestly, have a bunch it, more executive orders going up to the Supreme Court because they're completely extra constitutional. The biggest risk we run is actually appointments to the Supreme Court. But well, no. You know, I, well, you you bring up an interesting point about that in because terms of legislation. You you heard how Hillary wants to get appointed. This you heard who she wants to appoint if she's if she oh, becomes no, president, that, right? No, that's just a please don't hate me and please don't prosecute me. Yeah, no, I honestly think she plans on at least trying it. But I think it I think it may be exactly for that particular reason. Hey, if you uh, pardon me and I still get elected, then I can put you over here. I, I mean, there's a method to her madness, but I still believe she's going to try it. Only because she really is that crazy. So ultimately, Rick, to kind of wrap it up, um, you know, conventional wisdom says after the voting on Monday, people start dropping like flies. And we still have a relatively large field. Um, Please let them start I've, dropping. I've heard some of the, the, the lower tier candidates on, you know, interviews and things like that. Um, who do you think after Iowa will just throw in the towel? Honestly, with the stubborn as this group is, I'm not sure. Uh, the ones I want to see throw in the towel at this point, uh, definitely Kasich. Um, as much as I hate to say it, I think it's about time for Carly to figure out that she's probably not going to be able to get the nomination. I really like Carly. I don't know what happened. Cause she different. kicked butt in that earlier debate. Well, I'm, honestly, I have to admit, I was driving home, so I didn't get a chance to hear the earlier debate. So maybe my mind would have been different at this point if I'd had a chance to listen to it. Go back and listen to it. But I, I don't disagree with you, but I, I guess I would be disappointed if she doesn't un- end up somewhere in an administration. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying she shouldn't be a part of the administration because I'll be honest, the last debate, because I did catch the last one when she was back down on the lower tier stage, she kicked she, she kicked Riri in on that one too. But I think the issue is she's not able to keep the traction because, I mean, in my mind, I'm sorry, but with where he's been polling and his attitude, I really don't think that um, that Paul should have been the one that got the bump up to the main st- stage just because uh, Trump decided he wasn't going. I still think Carly deserves to be there. I don't know how she's lost her traction or what's happened, but at this point, it's just time for us to seriously start looking at the folks. I mean, especially like Kasich. That dude's got to go. Uh, Carson, I'm sorry. You made a good run. Your campaign's been crumbling I mean, from the inside. Kasich getting a lot of endorsements in New Hampshire and other places. I mean, it's hard to look. You and I can say, yeah, ugh. Mm. But yeah, I mean, look. I don't know. I don't know that that. No, no offense to anyone living in New Hampshire, but just because he may oh, win your state Diane's doesn't necessarily mean he's going to win anywhere else. Diane's going to kill you? Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. We're not scared of Diane much. Um, I never said I wasn't scared of Diane. I'm, <laughs> I'm smart enough to be scared of most of the women that I know. <laughs> there you go. That's why we like you, Rick. Um, you know, I, I don't disagree. Like, when I hear Kasich talk, I just start tearing out my hair. Um, yeah, he's not the guy, but unfortunately, with what his campaign is probably telling him, he will not drop out of after Iowa. Well, Iowa. no, I didn't say he was going to go. Um, I don't think he will. I think he needs to. Uh, <clears throat> the one that I honestly think most of all should be seriously considering dropping out at this point is going to be Carson. And that's only because his campaign's basically been imploding in on itself for the last few uh, the last few debate cycles. Um, he's not getting any positive traction. Honestly, I'm not going to lie. He peaked. This, this, well, yeah, but that's what she said. But <laughs> I, I can't help it. I fell asleep on Carson twice tonight. And he wasn't even talking that long, but I felt my eyelids drooping every time he talked. I'm not kidding. I'm an insomniac, and I'm about to put together an audio clip of him talking just because when I can't sleep, that's what I'm going to play. He's I mean, comforting. Yeah. No, not, and, not, and, not I, really. and I agree. When, <laughs> when you went neck and neck with Trump and kind of came crashing down, that's probably an indication you're not going to go back up. Um, you know, I think that's what Walker struggled with. He he was so high in the polling so early and then came down and couldn't figure out the formula to, to go back up. Um, you know, along with other reasons. But I, you know, I, I honestly think... Um, 
you know, if I have to take a look at it, I'm kind of hoping when Rick Santorum realizes he didn't win Iowa and a surprise, you know, come from behind win again, that maybe he'll step aside. Um, Gilmore, I mean, nobody even knew he was running until tonight, so I'm not that worried about that. He can stay and it's not going to make an appreciable difference. Um, hopefully he'll just realize that no, bye. Um, you know, I really think it's time for Huckabee to just go back and be a commentator on Fox. He's a really good one. And when he talks, he sounds like he should be doing a TV show. Uh, you know, he doesn't sound presidential. He sounds pundity to me. And um, I like some of his ideas, and I'll be 100% honest. Huckabee's tax plan is my favorite. Um, but he's not going to win. Um, and hopefully after Iowa, he kind of sees that too because he's not going to have some huge surge in the polls either. Um, you know, and, and I, I honestly think it's time for Rand to throw in the towel. I like Rand Paul on a lot of different issues, but th this isn't this isn't happening for him. Um, and even when he is not angry, for whatever reason, he's coming off as angry. And he's, I just don't get it. I see. And JD thinks he's angry pretty much any time he opens his mouth. I don't necessarily find him angry as much as I find his his actions and his mood lately to be bitter because I think he's I think in his mind he is better than where he is as far as his standing inside uh, the field right now and I think the fact that he's not able to break through is making him uh, bitter and I think it's starting well, to show you know why he ended up on the main stage don't you uh, because Trump wasn't there <laughs> well no well because Trump wasn't there but after Trump boxed the debate Rand Paul had refused to show up at the last one because he wasn't on the main stage. They couldn't have two candidates walking away. Yeah, I don't know. It wouldn't have hurt my feelings any. I know it wouldn't have hurt your feelings any, but from an optics perspective, I think that's probably why he got bumped up. I'm, that's just my own personal opinion. Um, and Yeah, but let me tell you, know, you why I, guess, I wouldn't have... I guess what I see is because I watched Rand Paul's announce, right? Um. His announce was positive. It was uplifting. His wife was there. I mean, it was just, it was a really, it, you left his speech feeling very, very good. And since then, and since the fisticuffs with Trump and, and you know, this sort of thing, he has just turned, and I, I don't view him as angry. I, I prefer to use the words, the word peevish. He's just kind of snotty. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Here, here's the reason why I disagree with the. Now let's. Now there was somebody in the chat that just put in that based on numbers they thought Rand probably would have been on the main stage even if Trump didn't bail. I don't know that that would be true. What I do know is if they if they bumped him up to the main stage solely based on the fact that they that he bailed on the last debate, then they made a very bad mistake because at that point they're basically rewarding bad behavior. So the next time somebody's not getting their way, they're going to do exactly the same thing. And then at, at some point, we have to realize that these, these things still have to be taken seriously. That's why I was so angry when Trump just took his ball and went home. I don't care if you thought you were going to be getting ambushed. You can't be the guy that stands there and tells the world, I'm going to stand up to everybody and I'm going to put Putin in their place, but I'm not going to take shots from a Fox News reporter. And all of these people that are all like, oh my God, Trump's standing up to the media. Are you kidding me? Have you Trump forgotten how stand up to the media? Trump didn't want to get another question that he didn't want to answer. Well, that's exactly my point. Have you for, have you guys that are all tra touting what he's doing right now? Have you forgotten how badly the media chews up and spits out conservative presidents, not only conservative pres presidential candidates, once it gets to the point where there's a there's the general election in place? Are you telling me that you've forgotten What's how badly the media treats them? If he can't handle the folks on our side of the aisle giving him a hard time, how is he going to stand up to anybody else? Well, he'll just refuse to talk to him. But that's my whole point. If he, you if know, he... I think Greg Gutfield, honestly, on the five yesterday, really nailed the fundamental issue. Our politicians and our candidates, we want to, you know, pound our fists about Obama for venue shopping and punishing news outlets who may disagree with him more often than others and certainly selectively go to the press. 
Fox News, despite the fact that they are a more right-leaning news organization than the average, um, absolutely did the right thing in standing their ground because Donald Trump's motivation in saying this was not to necessarily um, – I, I, I don't buy – I don't buy the idea that he was afraid of the questions he might get asked. He did this to try to destroy a journalist that made him mad. And I'm sorry, a free and a free and and, and unencumbered press in terms of how they choose to question and and report on our government is absolutely necessary. And the Fox organization did absolutely the right thing by standing their ground and keeping Megyn Kelly in their their debate no and and i agree um and you know it goes back to something i've been saying all over twitter for the last several days uh petulant man child that's exactly how trump came across with all of this and i think one of the things that stood out the most to me when i because i before my voice cut out on me last night i'd actually planned on talking about this in depth wound up having to run a replay of one of the other rants that i had done about trump because my voice quit about halfway through recording the uh, wnjc show um but anyway um, one of the things that I found was a clip where he's standing up and he's talking to the press and he said, these people are going to have to understand that when they're dealing with me, they're dealing with an adult. I'm not a baby. They can't treat me this way. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that exact statement makes it, makes you sound exactly like it, what it is that you're claiming you're not. Exactly. <sighs> I mean, I don't, I don't know why anybody would be under the mistaken impression that if you are going to be what is ostensibly the leader of the free Western world, you're going to be treated fairly. Okay. Can, you know, can I just be I completely no honest about us. this concept of fairness for a second? I don't know where this concept even came from. I don't know. I, I don't either. Because the, George the, W. Bush treated fairly by the press. Well, no, I mean life in general. Everybody seems to have no, this no, no, concept no, no. that when life is supposed to be fair. Small, when my children were small, um, my father-in-law had quite an interesting saying to them. Whenever they would say, Papa, that's not fair. He would look at them and say, fair is when I'm eating your candy. <laughs> See, Life is not fair. Get over it. <laughs> See, my comeback for my children always when they said that, the, the, the state fair here comes in September. So anytime they would say, Dad, Dad, that's not fair. I'm like, Sorry, if you want fair, you got to wait till September. I mean, I just don't know where the concept of, of fair came. I mean, I understand we would like journalists to be unbiased. Um, we would like them to comport themselves like they have no opinion unless their job is to give us their opinions and they're, you know, writing editorials and doing commentary. Um, that's not actually the world we live in. And everybody has some type of bias that may come out. And, you know, I think some journalists do a better job than others um, in trying to mask that, you know, even for all of his um, apparent love for Trump, uh, Sean Hannity, when he has other candidates on his show, is very respectful to them. He asks them good questions. He gives them time to put out their policies and points of view. So I know a lot of people have been frustrated with Hannity, but when I've seen other candidates on his show... I think he's still doing a credible job of giving them airtime and space to say what they would like to say. Um, yeah, I, I think he's doing it. O'Reilly, a, not so much. I think Hannity's doing a decent job of it. I will tell you that yesterday on the drive home, I almost heard him say Donald Trump's slogan twice, and he stopped himself. <laughs> really? Yep. <laughs> That's bad. Yeah, I mean, and you could tell, too, because he was all, well, we're going to, we need to find someone who's going to make a me and then he would just stop and figure out something else to say. I was like, dude, you really almost dropped the slogan, didn't you? And then at first I just thought, yeah, maybe it was just me. 20 minutes later, after a commercial break, he did the exact same thing again. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> And I mean, I don't know. It is one of those slogans where you catch. I mean, I don't even like Donald Trump, but half the time I'm like, eh, it's not a bad slogan. I just wish the guy that said it actually knew what the hell he was doing. Right. <sighs> That's kind of really a bad slogan. I'm not big on slogans to begin with. I understand you need a T-shirt. You need a hat. I get all that. But, you know, not a big fan. Yeah, but I mean, anyway. 
Well, it's it's no different than everything else. I mean, that's like all the can. The, the one thing that honestly drives me crazy anymore about debates is every time a candidate ends a sentence, please go visit my website at blah 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 dot com. I'm like, really? I mean, it it we've become. Well, I mean, you're not going to give a full answer to some of those questions in a minute and a half either. So, well, yeah, I mean, I know, is, I, if you want full details as to that response, you can find it here. But here's a summary. I I don't so much have an issue with that. I, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I'm I'm old. I just well, yeah, kind of like the YouTubes. Well, you know, at least I at least I don't call stuff the Twitters. <laughs> we do that just to be sarcastic. But, well, no, um, I know. No. I just I had to take my shot. Rick, I gotta be honest. Uh huh. I'm exhausted. I know. So to wrap this up, your prediction, Iowa, three, two, one. Um, my prediction, Iowa. Um. Uh, Sad to say, I think it's probably going to come down to probably, I mean, I honestly don't have a prediction at this point, but I'm pretty sure that Trump didn't really hurt himself as much as everybody likes to think that he might. I still think he may actually take Iowa. I'm going to call it Cruz Trump Rubio. Yeah, that was kind of, well, I don't know, maybe Trump Rubio Cruz. I think Cruz has dropped so much in the standings, and I don't think he helped himself tonight really with the debate because anytime he had a chance to stand up on his own, he took a shot at Donald uh, for the first few segments of the debate. He really shouldn't yeah. have done that. It was like J.D. was talking about earlier. Uh, the dogs finally caught the car, and then all they did was slob bar all over the windshield. It didn't do any good. Yeah, well, and I don't think he understood. You know, here's the thing, and I'll I'll just wrap up with this, and then I'll say good night, Rick. Um, the thing that makes me the craziest about all of this is there's basic math involved here. So when you look at Republican support for Donald Trump, it's probably somewhere in the high mid to high 20s as a percentage because there's a whole lot of independents in there. And that's not a majority. And people are really confused because of the big field. They're thinking that's a majority. So, like, nobody was going to watch the debate tonight because Donald wasn't on it. No, 70% of Republicans are still looking at other people. And, oh, by the way, those folks in Iowa, 40% of them, somewhere between 30 and 40% of them, don't make up their mind until the day they go to vote. You know, so this kind of overwhelming that we have a front runner and a majority candidate in a normal election year with a, shall we say, normal sized field, this would be a very, very different race and there would be no clear front runner. And if he was going to be able to build the coalition that everybody is telling you that he has the ability to build, who is a Trump supporter, with all of the $300 million in free media he has gotten, it should already be built. Exactly. Um, and like I said, I could be completely wrong, but the one thing that keeps running through my head is even you mentioned that the majority of the folks are there are there. Are how many people in Iowa again and how many actually even bother to participate in the caucus? So. Well, no, what it, uh, what it is, there's three million residents in Iowa, uh, mm -hmm. roughly 500,000 total Democrats and Republicans participate in the caucuses. That's total for both parties. And of those, a record number in Iowa would be 170,000, and they're projecting about 130. Yeah. So, um, well, the point out, the, the reason I brought that up is I have a feeling that, unfortunately, as much as I don't want to say this, a lot of the folks that are going to make the effort are, have probably been the same ones that have bought into the Trump train as much as I really wish they hadn't. And I hope I'm wrong. I'm just going to be honest, but I still have a sneaking suspicion. Well, it gets he, even he may weirder win Iowa. when you get to like Nevada because they're closed primaries there. You have to be registered in a party like only 7% of the population votes. Yeah. Oklahoma's the same way. Closed primary, very low turnout, usually fully red, um, but still really not much turnout to speak of because there's closed primary. Um, I have to register as a Republican or I cannot vote in the Republican primary. Um, if it were up yeah, to me, I would I, be... I, I'm glad I don't live in one of those states. If it were up to me, I'd be registered as an independent, but then I couldn't do anything but vote in the general. Yeah, no. Because this year, Rick, this year, the primary is the most important election. Yes, it is. Well, thank you very much for hanging out with me when JD's internet went down. Sorry, guys. Verizon apparently went completely 
Kabuki in Long Island, New York, so he will not have internet access until sometime tomorrow. Wow, that's um, that's that's twice lately that's happened. That's twice, I know. I think you know. I keep telling him he's got to move to a better climate where maybe there's not twelve feet of snow on the wires and all that stuff. But you know. See, and I figured with me moving way out in the middle of nowhere, I'd be the one with the internet issues, and I really haven't had that meter to speak of. Not you know, my internet provider actually ramps down the speed after 11 o'clock at night, and I haven't really had any issues. So, All right, well, know. folks, we I are, live in the sticks too. We are going to go ahead and let Miss Stacy get out of here. I've got about five minutes worth of wrap-up. We haven't taken a break, so I'm probably going to give a shout-out to the few sponsors. For those of you hanging out in the chat room, thank you for hanging out with us. Late tonight, much later than usual. Again, this has been the America Off the Rails, the Roundhouse Edition, the Better Late Than Never special, thanks to Skype and some pencil neck geek we're going to call Skype, Corky. Stop updating. <laughs> I mean, come on. Do you? So why do they got to fix what ain't broken? It was working just fine. I liked it. And now it's crazy. All right, so... All right, so on the way out the door, folks, just want to give a shout-out to a couple of quick sponsors. First of all, Mr. Slickery Trigger, thank you for hanging out in the chat room all night, folks. For those of you who may not know, he is the founder of Rebel Road Tactical. Look him up at rebelroadtactical.com. Uh, also want to give a new shout-out uh, shout to our newest sponsor. That would be politibrick.org. You can look them up on Twitter and also on their website. They are running a 6 for 5 special right now. Get every single brick they offer for 5 bucks. They're really soft. You can throw things. You can throw them at your TV and it won't break. I wish I had one tonight because I would have been throwing one at Carson just to keep myself awake. Uh, also, one last shout out to concealandcarry.net. If you're looking for ammunition, weaponry, or classes and training, make sure you visit their website. It's pretty easy to find. You put the word conceal, the letter in, the word carry.net at the end. As soon as it pulls up, you're going to see a map of the country. Click your state. It will tell you exactly where you need to go that's near you to find what you're looking for. All right, that is going to do it for this particular episode, folks. I am Rick Robinson. You've been listening to myself and Stacy Lennox. And for the first part of the show, Mr. JD, who has no internet. I'll be back with you hopefully live tomorrow night, God willing. Until then, put down the remote, get off the couch, and stay involved. Have a good night, folks. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call one 800 516 602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. In these uncertain economic times, you've got to do whatever you can to save money. One of our biggest expenses can be our cars, especially when unexpected repair bills hit. Not anymore. If you own a vehicle with less than 130,000 miles, is less than 12 years old, has a warranty about to expire, or even no warranty at all, you could stop paying for car repairs. Roadside assistance, towing, and rental coverage are all included. Don't wait for the next repair. Make one free call right now to see if you qualify. If your vehicle vehicle is less than 12 years old, has less than 130,000 miles, even if it's out of warranty, paying for car repairs can become a thing of the past. Call us right now and get your car protected before your next repair bill hits. Get protection and no more repair bills. Call 800-696-1030. Again, 800-696-1030. That's 800-696-1030. 800-696-1030. Joe.